trees communicate with each other. Maybe you know this. If you've come across Suzanne Simard's work or have read Richard Power's novel, The Overstory, for which Suzanne was the inspiration for one of the main characters. It's incredible stuff. Trees send out signals when they're being attacked by an insect, so other trees have a chance to produce defensive enzymes. Tall, old trees send photosynthesized energy from their massive canopy to young seedlings in the shade. They share water, nutrients, and other resources. It's not the story that we often hear or tell about how nature works. We have long used the language of competition to describe the relationship among living organisms. Scientists, Western scientists that is, have been convinced that trees struggle and compete for light and water. Survival of the fittest has been understood to mean that an individual plant takes up as much space and as many nutrients as possible, crowding out others and winning the evolutionary battle. Suzanne has spent her career painstakingly proving otherwise and then defending her research. There has been, she says, so much distrust about the idea of this communication going on, this collaboration, because we were so heavily steeped in the idea that trees only compete, when in fact, they survive and thrive in a collaborative network. Our gospel reading this morning is a bit of a jump. We've been in the gospel according to Mark, walking alongside Jesus in his approach to Jerusalem. And now we're in John, right in the middle of Jesus' trial. Pontius Pilate, the governor of the region of Judea, is questioning Jesus, trying to uncover whether Jesus is a threat to the Roman emperor, to which Pilate himself is subject, and whether executing him would be the politically savvy move. Are you a king? Pilate asks. He considers this critically important information in deciding how to proceed with this small town rebel. But Jesus flips the whole thing. He questions Pilate, and he puts the system itself on trial. Whose power here is legitimate? What way of organizing human relationships is most real and true? When this feast day, the feast of Christ the King, was created in the 1920s, it served as a prophetic witness. In contrast to the intense nationalism and secularism growing around the globe. Not that much has changed in a hundred years. It served and serves as a reminder that our ultimate loyalty is not to any ruler of earth not to any governor, president, king, or political party. No matter how fiercely we believe in the cause, none of them will save us. We have one savior to whom we submit our whole lives, who is the source of our security and peace. Personally, I greatly appreciate the recent move of many mainline denominations to refer to this day as the reign of Christ. It pushes back on our gendered stereotypes of power and leadership and helps us to focus on what kind of realm Christ leads, a reign of truth, justice, and love. 
still that image, whether king or ruler, remains. And that carries with it an implication of distance. A ruler is removed from their subjects, often inaccessible or unapproachable. Exactly the opposite, I think, of what Jesus reveals about his so-called kingship to Pilate. You use the word king, he says, but I am here to testify to the truth. I am speaking in the hearts of all who will listen, and we belong to one another. Pilate is worried about structural power, political jockeying. Jesus is pointing to the fact that the framework itself is broken, or perhaps that it was purposely made in this painful, horrible way. If this were a worldly system that Jesus was heading up, his followers would be fighting because that is how you gain control in systems of domination and power. In fact, the church is regrettably guilty of having done just that in Jesus' name. But Jesus' response to Pilate is that he is the one who says Jesus is king. Jesus himself says that he has come to serve what is real and true and life-giving. All who want to live deep in truth are connected to him and he to them. Suzanne and her graduate students have mapped forest networks and found that all the trees of a forest are connected to all the other trees. Certain individuals act as hubs, or what Suzanne calls mother trees. They are the biggest and oldest, the elders of the forest. They feed the entire network, sending resources to baby trees that otherwise could not survive. And one of the most fascinating things about this research is that it's not just trees of the same species that collaborate. Douglas fir sends warning signals to ponderosa pine. Paper birch and Douglas fir share carbon and other nutrients. Cedars and maples seem to influence the ability of Pacific yews to create defense chemicals that are protective against certain diseases. The entire forest, in Suzanne's words, is a single living organism wired for wisdom and care. These various species are wired together through a vast interconnected system of mycorrhizal fungi that you cannot see. The network is infinitely complex and it extends for hundreds of kilometers beneath our feet. It's unbelievable. It's so unbelievable, in fact, that Suzanne reports being worn down by the amount of hand-wringing over whether this network exists, because you can't see it with your own eyes. People can't believe it because it fits neither what they experience nor what they think they already know. Our collective understanding of the forest has been stymied by our own language, by our prevailing metaphors for how the world works. Professionally, it has been extremely difficult for Suzanne to employ metaphors like mothering or eldering because they are not taken seriously. The scientific language says that these trees and fungi are completely distinct. They are in different plant kingdoms. Are you a king? Pilate asks. Instead of answering directly, Jesus points to an entirely different system. 
The kingdoms of this world fight for power and dominance. They compete, try to obliterate one another. They divide land and people. Jesus is perhaps more like the mother tree, sending sustenance, life, and vitality out through the whole interconnected, interdependent network. Forests, Suzanne says, are regenerative systems. They are built that way. They evolved that way. And so are human beings, she insists. We might create these outward systems of hierarchy, but fundamentally we are connected one to another. In healthy networks, both ecosystems and communities, Mutuality sustains life and helps each member to flourish. Suzanne sees it happening. The old help the young, the large help the small, and it's reciprocal. That is the way things really are underneath. These networks of collaboration and life-giving support are the truth of creation. As we gather this day to consider our strange and wonderful king, may our own metaphors not get in the way. May we hear and listen to the voice of Jesus speaking even from the earth beneath our feet. May we live into the truth of our interconnectedness in a way that doesn't look like anything we've seen before. Friends, in the face of yet another trial that did not bring true justice, here is our good news. Christ comes offering a different vision. A different vision for kingship, for power, authority, and relatedness. Standing resolutely in the face of most all powers we have known, this is a way not of competition or violence, but a way of sharing nourishment and resources. Across kingdoms, and any other means of division we create, the reign of Christ reveals the truth, both comfort and challenge, that we are all entirely connected.